And now a look at the PIP System Corebook, a D6 based generic role playing system that's great for new players and kids. Please note, note that Eloy LaSanta provided us with a review copy of this book. No other compensation was provided. Now, it's also worth noting this is a read review only. I have sat down and read this core book and flipped through it and gone through it a couple times, but I have not gotten the chance to get it to the table either as a player or a game guide. Now, normally this is the part of the review where I tell you and to go to our YouTube unboxing video, but that's not the case today. RPG rule books aren't really something you can unbox, though maybe if people wanted a page flip video, let us know. Sure, I, we could do that. Now, what I can do is tell you what I thought about the production quality of the book, which was excellent. Now, I am talking about the paperback version of the PIP System Core book here. It is also available in both PDF and hardcover. Now, my copy is a digest size paperback book, very well bound, uh, clocks in at 144 pages long. Uh, it includes everything you want in an RPG rule book, including a full table of context, an index, and a character sheet at the, on the last page of the book. Uh, it's full colored. Lots of excellent, evocative artwork showing diverse characters and scenes from a bunch of different genres. Because again, this is a universal system. Uh, the text is larger than usual than you see in most books, which is kind of nice. Kind of reminds me of a kid's book, which my aging eyes definitely had appreciated. Uh, it's also a good indication of the family nature, family friendly nature of this book. Uh, text is in a pretty standard two column format for the majority of the book, only broken for things like uh, charts and sample characters. Overall, I found it to be well-written, easy to read and clear. Uh, my first read-through was done in a single afternoon. So this is one that you're going to have to keep reading multiple days. Now, I may, may, most people might break that up over a couple days, but still. Now, uh, for RPG reviews, RPG review reviews are always a little hard to, to cover on a podcast. So over on the blog, I deep dive this book literally chapter by chapter. So I go into each chapter, what they present, how they presented, how well the information is presented and so on. So if you want to know everything you get here in detail, I do encourage you to check out the article. For the podcast though, I'll be sticking to more of a general overview of the game book. Now, before I go further, it's worth noting this is a generic role-playing system. So this is a system created to let you play multiple types of games, almost any type of genre or setting. Uh, the character generation is generic so it can be it's, it's done the same for all settings but other rule sections are kind of split uh depending on what you're talking about and though what Aloy has done here is presented um four different main setting types which are fantasy modern sci-fi and spooky these are presented all of the rules are presented as guidelines and suggestions on how to do things to capture the feel of a specific genre but players are free to mix match and mash up to create unique settings so how much different, uh, when it comes to actual mechanics, how much do they differ between genres or is it more related to the character page and the character creation that is on its own where the mechanics live? The only place you have any unique mechanics is the magic system. So if you want to throw magic into your game, so mainly a fantasy game, but also think if you want space wizards, you might also use the magic system for that or like psionics or, or even in a sci-fi or spooky setting, you might want to throw in some magic. But generally, that's the only one that has anything unique. Everything else is it's just a way to group the stuff so that like the, the rules for robots are in the sci-fi section. So if you want the monster stats for robots, you look there. And when you're generating, we'll get to this in a minute, but you, there's some random tables you use to generate some stuff. Well, they're, they're specific to the setting just for thematic reasons. Mechanically though, they're all identical. So there are three pretty simple steps to making a character in the PIP system. You're going to choose an archetype. You're going to choose skills and qualities, or sorry, buy skills and qualities. And you're going to roll on, to, on some random charts to determine two random things about your character. Uh, you're given 16 different archetypes. The archetypes determine your two health stats. There's physical health and mental health. Those are your two hit points, if you want to use that D&D &D term. They give you three of your starting skills, uh, two at two, one at one. And they give you a special ability that's unique to the archetype. Finally, you also get a hindrance, which is also unique to that archetype. Uh, these include, I'm not going to go through all 16 different types, but like there's adventurer, artisan, brute, chef, magic user, marksman, sleuth, tinkerer, as some of the examples. So pretty much what you'd expect when you hear a list of archetypes. Yep. Now, after you pick your archetype, you're going to customize using build points to buy skills and qualities. Um, there are 14 skills in the game. Uh, these would be your stats in D&D. &D. Like instead of having strength, dex, con, you instead have a bunch of skills like coerce and 
uh, strike and aim are different ones. Um, qualities are basically like specializations. It's the way I like to think of them from other games. So like you will have your core skill, but you could spend points in liar, which is a quality under the skill course. A character is in a quality uh, level in a quality can never be higher than the level in the skill. These two combined are going to tell you how many dice to roll once we get to the mechanics. Now, in addition to that, there are a number of advanced qualities. These are just basic like, special abilities. And it was a way for, for the game to include things like backstabbing, um, being able to fly, or being able to cast spells. So they, these were unique abilities that you could buy in addition. And they're based on, you have to have certain prerequisites to be able to buy them. You also use those build points to buy gear but again, this isn't like a shopping trip type of thing. It's more creating like things that are unique to your character. So if you have like your father's magic sword, or if you have a suit of powered armor, or if you happen to have a jet bike, you would build it using build points. Right. Now, some people can be against these point systems because yeah. along with the flexibility that you get with them comes a sort of uh, analysis paralysis of character design uh, with too many choices. Is there any mitigation for that or is it um, sort of go to town it kind of goes both so part of what they've done is if you want to get to the game right away they did provide a number of sample characters that are already built so if you just want to dive right in this is a good i guess especially if you're playing with kids or new gamers so you don't have to present those choices uh they do walk through how to build a character and i think the big one here is going to be the level of mastery that the um they call it the game guide in this instead of the game master because a lot of people have had a problem with the term master over the years and i do get changing it so game guide or just guide which i dig it that term works so the guide in this case if they know it, there's only 14 skills. So you're not doing strength deck con, right? Instead, you're looking at 14 things, which is, say, more than D&D. But it's going to be one of those things where you're going to specialize in one or two areas. So you're going to look and go, you know, I want to build a swashbuckler, so I'm going to want aim, I'm going to want athletics, and I'm going to want piloting because I want to be able to use my boat, for yeah. example. So I, there are choices, but I don't think it's too many. I've definitely played games that have way more skills, way more things to pick. Right. Uh, like Vampire being an example of a game that probably has three times more things to pick from. Right. But it's not as simple as roll 4d6 and drop them in order either. Right. Now, character creation finishes off with a random element, and this is two rolls on two random charts. So there's six different charts for each of the four different genres. So first, you're going to find the genre you're playing in. You're going to drop a die to see which chart you roll on, and then you're going to roll again to see what item you bid on it. Um, these are all over the place. Like, there's, just as an example, there's the mo modern fun item chart where you could get a boom box or a remote control car. Or there's the sci-fi features table that could give you implanted gills or retractable reading glasses. There is a lot of fun stuff on here. And um, I'm a, the, the designer really pushes to throw this random element so that even though you've come up with your swashbuckling person who's going to pilot their boat, why do they have a doll that squeaks? And then throwing that into their, their their whole character concept, or why do they why are they missing one eye? Because it's not just items on these tables. There's also affectations or whistles all the time might come up. It's like there is a big, it's a lot of different options on these charts. Right. So a fun nudge through the random element that players can use to help direct their character design with, you know, oh, I got a, a radio and an implanted gills, so my swashbuckler is actually going to be a submersible DJ. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That sounds like I don't want to play, now Sean's got to play a submersible DJ in a game. <laughs> totally like getting crowds of fish swarming around and being able to control them like a rocker boy in cyberpunk, the best oh, class ever made by man. Now the basic mechanics moving past the character. Now you got this. So what you're going to do is, is your typical, the player describes what they want to do and the game master decides what skills apply. But what they do push here is there should be a conversation that it shouldn't just be the game guide who always determines what skills. If a player can come up with a good reason that a skill can be used, they should be able to do it. So that's something nice to see. It's a, it's a very modern way of thinking compared to older traditional games. So you're going to sit there and you're going to build a dice pool at a white dice. So you're going to get points for your skill if you have any qualities that apply. And then your gear or anything else that applies, you get to also throw in some dice. You're going to make a bunch of white dice based on those factors. Then the game guide, which is, again, the game master, is going to decide the challenge rating from one to five. They're going to give you a number of black dice, depending on how difficult they think it can be. Now, if you're looking at opposing another character, 
the number isn't just a number arbitrarily assigned by the GM. It's instead based on the 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 stats of the extra. The extras is their term for for uh, NPCs. So another one I thought like because the Eloy's argument is the characters of the stars. So everyone else is an extra. Like fair, I like it. Uh, so the extra might have a stat. So if I if I'm trying to race an extra, I look at the extra's athletic. That's the challenge rating instead of a number one to five arbitrarily assigned. So basically, it's your opposition. It's it's how difficult what you're trying to do is. You grab black dice for those. You get a huge pool and you roll them all. So I have to say, opposed dice pools are something I haven't seen too often, and an interesting choice. Um, now, I haven't done the numbers on it. I know there's there's some programs out there uh, that'll let you do opposed mm -hmm. dice uh, math on any dice. Uh, and I'm interested in looking to those. But it's it's definitely an interesting choice to go with self-rolled opposed dice pools. Yeah. The self-rolled is definitely different. The, the you roll everything yourself is a unique design choice. And in the book, it does mention you could switch it up so that someone else rolls the opposition. But as written... Um, so what you're doing here now is you're looking for successes. Really simple. This is this is a even odd. It could be. It, it is. Um, there is an entire role playing system based on this, and you can buy special dice just for it. And I can't remember the name of it. I think it might be the Ubiquity system, where it's literally fifty fifty chance on every dice. Ubi Ubiquity is the one. Yeah, it's the Ubiquity system. So you could probably play this with the Ubiquity system and reduce the number of dice you're rolling. But anyway, the the whole thing is if you roll four, five, or six, it's a hit. So fifty fifty chance you got a hit on your dice. You're gonna take all your dice to hit and put all the other ones aside and count them if you have more white dice if you have at least one more white die that's hit than black dice you succeed pretty simple if you have at least one more black die you fail if you tie that's where you pull in the improv very modern role-playing yes but result so you succeed at a cost and that's up to again the game master to, to come up with the sorry the game guide to come up with uh, what happens, but they are encouraged to work with the players. Um, if you succeed, though, they also have a crit and a, and a fail system in here. If you succeed by three or more on your white dice, so if you have more than three successes than on the white than the black, you get an epic success, uh, which is a yes and. So you get something in addition to succeeding. And then similarly, if a task fails by three or more, you have an epic failure where the guide provides an additional no and. So not only did you fail, but you also hit all your friends or also the building collapsed or you hurt an innocent bystander or something. Now that's the basics. Um, there's more to it, obviously. There's burst dice, which where dice explode on a six that can get you can get for certain items and feats. There's modifiers for terrain and cover, uh, rules for working together, rules for extended tasks, all the stuff you expect to find in pretty much any role-playing game. Yeah, it's, it's a deep system with a lot of moving parts. And unlike the beginner's folios and shadow room we discussed previously, I'm guessing the math here isn't free done for you no. to generate your pools. No, and, and it couldn't be because this is one of those games where just because a quality is under one skill, they don't necessarily have to go together. And there's very much the, uh, I call them BSing style of, of role playing where the player if they can come up with a good enough reason to use things they can which is pretty common in modern narrative yeah like i said that it's definitely a, it's definitely a thing so there's a big part of that to this so i don't think they could pre-calculate any of the pools because it's all going to be about well this quality applies because and well remember three days ago i did this so i get to apply this to it as well so there's definitely nothing like that now, again, another uh, almost hallmark of modern role-playing games is some type of spendable resource that lets you change the game, and that does exist in this. Uh, it's fortune. Every session, you start with three fortune points. These can be done to do a number of things like healing, um, adding a white die to a roll, adding a white die after you've seen the results, which is interesting, but that costs two fortune. Um, create narrative advantage, which is literally you spend a fortune to be able to add something to the scene. Um, suggestions include things like bringing in other characters that aren't present so that other people can get involved in the scene, having advantageous situations happen, you know, like a thunderstorm happens just before you're about to try to escape the castle or whatever. Um, casting extra spells, which gets into the magic system. And what they call passive luck, what that can be used for is something bad was going to happen to your character, but you don't know what it is, but the DM gives you an option to spend it. So it's like, oh, would you like to spend a fortune right now? And they're like, uh, yeah. Okay, you duck as a to tie your shoes just as a bullet whizzes over your head, right? So that's what they call a, a system called passive luck. Uh, there's a couple other ways you can do it. Earning fetch fortune is done for this is a good one. This is a fail forward thing. Anytime you get an epic failure, you get rewarded for it. You get a fortune point. So yeah, something crappy happens to your character, but at least you get a fortune point out of it. Um, when you roll an epic success, so you get that I did it and 
you can forego the ants. You can say, no, nah, no, nah, I just want to succeed. That'll get you a fortune, fortune point. And the game guide and the other players are also welcome to give rewards for immersive role playing. Like someone just like that's supposed to be like a big, like almost standing ovation moment where you want to clap. You're like, here you go. Here's your Benny. Here's your reward for doing it. Right. And and that sort of thing really makes for a more narratively flexible system, right? Mm -hmm. You're not you're not locked in by the randomness of the dice system. You've got that little extra oomph because you know that doing that thing is just gonna make the whole scene yep. sing. Yeah, again, it's a trademark of modern role playing, really. Yeah. Uh there's obviously more to this. Um there are rules for conflict, so that's a step above what we described before is basically the task system. Um, no, conflict doesn't necessarily mean fight. Uh, this could be an argument to a starship dogfight. Rules are basically the same with a couple extra rules like timing. So there is an, an initiative system, which is really simple. Just use a D6 and an attack versus defense system. Again, attack doesn't necessarily mean like firing a weapon. Attack could mean uh, 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 insulting someone or trying to get push someone over the edge or a... Um, a court like debate or trying to become prom king all those different things so they uses the term attack but it doesn't necessarily mean with violence when attacking the attacker picks which skill they use and interestingly the defender chooses which skill to defend with that's what i like it's the fact it's a choice skills are not specifically set for each type of combat though of course there are a number of skills that probably are going to fit the story better or fit better but what this means is well an attacker might use strike that's your basic hit someone in melee type of attack to hit you with a sword you might decide to defend with coerce because you're trying to distract them with witty barbs which i really dig that the other big change in conflict of course is your margin of success is the damage you do so if you succeed with three successes above the black you're doing three damage uh, all characters have physical and mental health and you can choose which. So again, even if you're attacking with the sword, you could do mental damage, which represents the person becoming uh, fatigued and stressed out instead of specifically injured. Now, when you get into uh, vehicles and extras, they just have one stat just to keep things simple. Right. Well, that makes sense. I I'm getting more used to this whole choices for which skill you use. Uh, yeah. And the key here is really having your guide uh, push back a little bit, not, mm. not to fight with them, but to encourage those players to really, uh, you know, justify narratively yeah. the rule. You know, you don't want to. You don't want your players saying, "Well, I've got a six here and a four there, so I'm going to roll the six. No, no. Why? You know, oh, because yeah. you're a joker and you think you're you're going to crack the perfect joke and have them fall over laughing while they're trying to swing the heavy sword. You know, mm -hmm. but you know, make sure they're they're doing that, especially I think with the younger game players, uh, and get them into that idea of. Uh, directing the narrative. And then just as an example, if you want to talk about seeing someone use coerce to defend, just to, let's see anything with Spider-Man. There you go. <laughs> as an example. I will note in the book, uh, Aloy, that we haven't gotten to this yet, but there is a chapter I'm playing with kids. He very much pushes the, just let them instead say yes. Like right. whatever reason they come up with. I think the pushback is more for all. Well, I, and I say, well, when I say pushback, it's pushback to make sure they have a reason. They have a reason. So that yeah. isn't, this number is higher. Uh, if you want to give me a reason and it's silly, that's fine. It's still a reason. Uh, but make sure that there's a reason narratively. Fair enough. All right. Uh, there is a full, pretty simple, basic magic system. Um, it's prevented, again, for people who want to do the fantasy thing or maybe have space wizards. Uh, there's a number of... Um, I, I'm not going to get into the details of the magic system. It does also have like a, the equivalent of a bestiary, right? It's a number of enemy extras. This is one of those sections that's broken into the four genres, so you have different ones. Uh, just to know of the genres, I meant to mention earlier, I like the ch choice of spooky instead of horror. Yep. Again, for a family-friendly game, that was a nice choice. And there's nothing horrific in here. Like into the spooky, there is a vampire. There's like swarm of spiders, and there's like animated dead. Like there's not a lot here. Uh, one of the more impressive chapters is the game guide tips, which is for the, the games master again. This is obviously written for players who have never run a role-playing game before and is a ton of good advice for stuff you don't always see in role-playing rule books, which should be in there, in my opinion, like setting up your first game, uh, actually managing character creation, customizing characters, how to run your first session, including in a rather short but an example of 
play actually happening, showing which roles were made. Uh, it talks about different types of stories. It talks about story beats, how you should mix up your story beats to keep the game interesting. Just lots of general RPG running advice here. Well, and this is always a super important section and one no core rule book should skip. Uh, it is never a bad idea to include a way to help new, fresh mm -hmm. new players succeed. And there's no, like, anyone who's experienced can always skip it. Yeah. You just flip back. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know how to run the game. Now, finally, there is a um, section in the back of the book that I thought was pretty interesting. And this is a simplified version of the rules, specifically for introducing it to either brand new players, like, like players who have no clue. They've never watched an episode of Critical Role. They don't really know what role playing is at all, or for kids. Um, and I gotta say, man, here's where I was getting flashbacks to Mermaid Adventures, which is a, a game from Aloy that I played. And actually where this review copy even came from, because I love Mermaid Adventures. And it was the first game I ever introduced my kids to. And Aloy wanted me to check out the new version. Well, the new version uses these new rules, which is why I was reading this book. So what they did here is they ditched the 14 skills and they give you four. And that's it. Really simple. And it's, I, I don't have them in front of me, but it's like mind, body, luck, and something. And that's it. And it's just like, if you're doing anything physical, it's body. If you're doing anything mental, it's mind. If it doesn't matter, it's luck. And I think there might be a conversation style character. You know, it's bugging me. Now I might. Now I'm, <laughs> so, and now I see how we get to what I was sort of expecting when you said, when you said you were reviewing this is I knew that this was for a kid's game yeah. about mermaids. Um, and so far this sounds like a game that for kids could be a lot of boring dice board oh, yeah. building <laughs> but that's it that's that's the thing is this is not this is written to be beginner friendly but it's not a kid system it does have this final chapter in the back of the book though to really simplify it down so in addition to only having four attributes instead of skills qualities now are whatever players want them to be and literally off the top of your head because again you're going with kids right like what do you want to have and what it is, is if that quality applies, you get plus one white die. Like no more, no more, that's it. That's it. There's, there's no other special qualities, no special rules, no flaming swords. If you have a flaming sword, you get plus one white die when you can use the flaming sword. That's it. Whereas the build rules in the original game are you can buy a flaming sword that's level one, two, three, or four, and each level gives it plus one die. And then you can get the quality of your level four sword to be flaming, which causes the on fire status effect, which I, again, I went into way more detail on the blog, but that is a thing you would do in the PIP system to build the flaming sword right. whereas in the simplified version it's flaming sword do you, do you use your flaming sword in this fight yep you get plus one white done um the other thing too is there is there is some paragraphs about how to play with kids uh, again very much on sticking with imaginative play with some restrictions versus playing a full role-playing game like it's it's a great introduction to structured play now, overall, I, I got to say, I was, I was very pleased with the overall impression of this book. Like, it's a, it's a solid, soft cover book. I dig the cover. I, it's behind me on the shelf where I'd hold it up. It's enticing. Like, I see that, and I'm like, oh, that's a cool cover. Really real, readable layout. Love the large font size with my aging eyes. Uh, thicker than expected paper. I, I, this was Kickstarted, so I'm wondering if, the, like, one of the Kickstarter upgrades was a paper upgrade. Because it just, like, I kept thinking I was missing a page in between because <laughs> I felt so thick uh lots full color lots of diverse and interesting art uh it was a breeze to read uh everything was presented in a logical order it all made sense uh game mechanics are pretty simple to learn and explain now the math behind them as sean said is probably like if you if you're one of those people who likes to know your exact odds of succeeding you're gonna have a hard time with this system but the actual building a dice pool is pretty dang simple uh character creation simple uh it's enough that i don't think you need a dedicated character creation session to sit down and play this game like you you can it's less than an hour easily to build characters if i was going to run this at a con i would have people build characters at the table um the two color dice system is elegant uh, it's definitely rules light it's definitely a rulings over rules style game narrative driven uh the focus is definitely on the narrative and the story and a huge push like everything in the rule book Eloy keeps repeating himself saying it's all to have fun it's all about having fun it's all about doing interesting fun cool things right and for me i think you know i i, I do hesitate with this kind of a dice pool system and i think it, the real thing that that would make or break this system for me is really in how the guide applied that system yeah uh the more narrative you are the harsher 
the the break can be when you need to all of a sudden sit down and assemble okay well, i need this stat and this uh, quality and this thing over here and this thing over here and okay so this i'm gonna have seven dice and then what's my difficulty gonna be oh it's gonna be five and okay so we're gonna do that and now okay and now i'm gonna move all my dice around to figure out whether it was hits or a final mm -hmm. hit or miss and that and that's a chunk of time that in a real narrative flow can can make or break if it's happening too often mm -hmm. i mean if it's a big decisive moment you want that you you, you want that interest but if it's happening, you know, every time if somebody fires a gun for a 10 minute gunfight, mm -hmm. you're now looking at an hour long gunfight because um, yeah. it can really stretch it out. So that's one of those things where dice pools are can be fantastic if the guide is using them, uh, you know, without, you know, thinking of them the same way you would those opposed D20 rules in a D&D &D game, which you can do constantly because it takes no time or effort. Yeah, I gotta say, this is something I wouldn't know until I sit down and play for one. Now, the game does stress not rolling for um, when you don't have to. Right. Like, it, it really pushes the definitely don't roll if you should just be able to succeed. Um, it notes the characters are competent and should be able to do what they're good at doing yep. without having to roll. So, it is pushed a little bit. Um, Mr. Ed and Mark, uh, again, excellent podcast talking about role playing games. Talks about the levels of play, and I'll admit off the top of my head, I don't remember the definitions of their levels, but there is definitely a change of levels when you drop to the mechanic level. And that is going to be a distinct thing. Like, there is that time of building your pool. There is yep. the... But then you still have narration in there because of that BS element, that right. why, how you're building the pool. Right. And how the many narrative justification. The, the yeah. narrative justification, I think, kind of keeps... Should at least keep everyone on the table interested versus that hard break of I rolled initiative, let's get the miniatures out right. that you have in some games. So I don't know. I, I Again, having not actually sat down and played it, well, I did play the previous version, but it was so simple and so quick that it was really easy. Like that was the thing with it with Mermaid Adventures. It was you had four stats and they only went up to five. Right. So it was really simple. It was like body, four, roll, grab four dice. And while you only had two qualities, so does your goldfish pet help or not? Yep. done okay grab the dice and roll it was nice and quick whereas this i can definitely see it taking longer to get out yeah and that's and that's really the thing like again the the kid this kids version you've described makes sense it, and it totally yeah. glosses that over and makes it a real quick system but i suppose it's how deep you choose to get mm -hmm. and how you know integrated you you want to get i do like the fact you mentioned there that you know they do assume that the players are competent and that's a big yeah. thing in modern narrative games um you have to assume that these are at the very least competent, if not skilled individuals mm -hmm. in their given role who can just yes. do things because they, you know, they're, they're not just the peasant off the street trying to swing a two handed broadsword. You know, they are a yes. fighter who can, knows how to use a sword. Correct. Or even a better example in this game, you're a chef who actually knows how to cook. There you go. Yeah. To, to move it away from the, the aggressive <laughs> combat style game. Yep. No, absolutely. So overall, as a universal system, I was impressed uh, by what this this book had to offer. I, I liked how it presented things from the four different genres. Again, fantasy, modern, sci-fi, and spooky covers a good range. The only thing to me that seems a little missing is maybe Western, but again, that's kind of modern, dumbing it down a little bit. I'm, I'm not sure what other genres are missing, so that, that, that was good to see. Uh, it was good to see how the basic mechanics could be tweaked. Right. So that like again, talking about the magic being your your Jedi powers, right? Your your space wizards. Um, though I did find one thing was missing from the book, and that does have to do with the setting, and that was any discussion on how to decide what you're gonna do with this book, right? Because this is a universal system. You could play anything with this. I would have liked the chapter dedicated to having session zero. Um, possibly even including things like safety tools, which again are not in the book. Um, and deciding what type of game your group wants to play, right? To talk about determining what the players do and don't want to see in the coming game, picking settings that fit what the players want to see and what they don't. Uh, things like cats we've talked about on the show before. Again, I don't know if that that might have came out after this, the particular cats thing. But the again, to quote Phil Vecchio, getting enthusiastic consent before you play. I think a chapter on that with the amount of talk there was on DM tools and having your first session and getting people to the table and picking characters and making characters that work together. It would have been nice to talk about the, the various settings you could play in. Like, how do you pick between fantasy, modern sci-fi and spooky? And how do you get everyone on the same page? Right. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting omission. Uh, and I do actually really question the, the lack of safety uh, tools in there, or, or at least some mention to go out and find 
safety tools. But it's possible this was written long before uh, Jason came up with the X card. I don't know. Possibly. To be but um, I, I, I wonder how many people would actually have the PIP core book without already having something in mind. True. Uh, either from one of those settings built into the book or picking up one of the many other PIP system books for that. I mean, between beside Mermaid Adventures and, and others. Overall, I, I was pretty impressed by the PIP system source book. It's, it's an excellent rules light, generic system. Um, used to run and play a number of different genre types, different settings, different systems. Uh, the basic mechanics of a two-color D6 dice pool, one color being good, one color being bad, it's pretty simple. I said my kids were able to pick it up with smaller dice pools, but the basic concept was easy enough to them, especially the the, the, the good versus bad. The, the good versus evil is, is a very clear message to children. Like Children just grasp that, right? These are the good ones, these are the bad ones. Um, I think it's a great introductory role-playing game for anyone new to RPGs. Like, I, I, if I had to introduce RPGs to someone, this might be a system I'd, I'd choose, especially over one of the more crunchier systems that are out there. And I think it's a great game for children. Now, in addition to the rules light variant there, makes it great for younger kids, like, I, I, like toddlers, right? Like little kids. And I think this is a great way to introduce structured play something that's a little more involved than just let's pretend, right? So that there's rules and consequences and constraints to that play. And that is something like I've done this firsthand with the original printing of Mermaid Adventures with my kids and they took to it right away to the fact that they now have role-playing rules they make up for their Playmobil because otherwise they argue over who gets to do what. They'll go grab dice and start rolling dice pools to see who won the battle instead of arguing back and forth, which is awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this the, the rules light version, the children's version in the back of the book is a fantastic way to get people in. Um, I'm a little less sold on, on the opposed dice rule system they've got. Again, uh, and that's a lot of it for the beginner guide more than the beginner mm -hmm. players because, again, I just, there, there's a real potential to bog down the narrative with, if, you're, if, you're, if you're overusing the mechanics. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that's hard to teach to a new guide. Yeah, I think the game did a pretty good job of pointing it out. But again, Excellent. with that, yep. I, I again, you haven't played it, so I haven't played it. <laughs> plus, I'm not a new guide, right? I, I yeah, haven't no, run absolutely. many games, so yep. it, it's hard. You can't. I can't really put myself in the mindset of someone who's never run a role playing game before. What it'd be nice to see is I would love to see a review of this from someone who's never played a role playing game before. If that's yep. out there, that would be yep. interesting to see. So I say, if you are thinking of getting your kids or someone else's kids into role-playing games, I check this out. Like, look up the Pip Sisson core book. I'm sure it's dirt cheap on Drive Through RPG in PDF. They, they these books usually are. Happens to be on sale on Amazon today, which was totally coincidental. I shared a deal on it today. Um, the other people who I think might want to look at this are educators. If you are thinking of bringing RPGs to the classroom, this might be a, a good book to do it with, especially being generic, because a lot of the role-playing games that are out there geared at educators and geared at kids are very much that Dungeons & Dragons, that that fantasy, go beat up the monsters and steal the loot style of game, whereas this being multi-genre could let you tell stories of insects or mermaids or space dolphins. Um for someone who's curious about role playing, like if there's anyone that happens to listen to the show that listens to us for our board gaming content and are curious about uh, role playing games and are intimidated by the big games, like say Dungeons and Dragons or crunchy games like Shadowrun, that not only have a large investment cost wise, but also in learning wise, in, in uh, time investment and learning to play, this would be a great place to dip your feet into the hobby. Now, I say for more experienced role players out there, this is going to be on you. Um, if this sounds like something your group would dig, if you're looking for a rules light system you can play anything with, uh, this may be your new jam. Absolutely. For a more in-depth look at the PIP System Core Book, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.